McIntyre, your humblest host here at the Next Level Podcast. And uh, listen, we're, we're at, we have a very special guest. Thank you for joining us today. You might be on the treadmill. You might be walking. You might be on a, uh, a road trip. Or you just might be sitting in your house listening. And uh, we just thank you for listening to the Next Level Podcast here at McIntyre. We're so honored that you're here. And I just want to remind you to uh, subscribe and share this podcast. We got some major traction out there, man. I know Joe Rogan's worried about us nipping at his heels, but we're working on it. Come on. Uh, so I love it. And it's all because of you, this amazing audience out here. And I know we've got audience members listening all around the globe. And uh, we love that. We're so appreciative. And so we really, we're really attracting some really cool cats here. And this one's the, one of the coolest. And this is... Uh, he told me just to call him Neil, but I'm going to let him know that he is Dr. Neil E. Goodman, medical doctor. And uh, this guy is uh, a genius. And he's also been in 37 years here in adolescent medicine, uh, pediatrics. And he's coming to us live, I believe, from the islands on there in the Caribbean. Welcome aboard, Neil. Glad to have you at Next Level. All right. Thank you so much, Michael. Hey, just to correct you, yes. I am actually on the coast of Georgia, just a little bit below Savannah. Gotcha. Uh, okay. So, yeah, but but I am on the East Coast, and it is a tropical climate. But <laughs> I wish it was. The Bahamas. <laughs> okay, that's right. Because we've got a mutual friend, Sandy McGuire, that's connected us. Yes, and absolutely. And yeah. she is a she's a special woman. And Sandy, we thank you for this amazing connection. Uh, indeed. So, all right, uh, Neil. So they call you the Biohacker USA. Now, why do they call you that? I mean, that's a. I love the title, bro. It's really good, man. But explain to our listeners and our audience what's the Biohacker USA. Okay. Well, there's actually three components to that word. Uh, the first component is biohacker, which is split into bio, which means biology or life, and hacking or hacker is doesn't connote like. Um, computer hacking, something to make something worse. It's to actually take advantage of and to make better your own biology. So that's the biohacker part. I'm all about improving people's biology and health through knowledge and science. And that's what I do. It's, and then I love the that. US, USA part is because I'm a patriot. Come on, so brother. I was uh, 14 years United States Army in, uh, in the medical corps. I've been all over the world in the, in the uh, medical corps. My wife is a combat surgeon. Uh, she's, by the way, an obstetrician and gynecologist, and she's, we're both out of the military now. We're both in civilian practice. We've been so in our own private practice. I've been practicing for 37 years combined, and uh, I'm also a professor of pediatrics and uh, just love to talk about medicine, walk, love to talk about health, but um, my, I'm, I'm a conservative patriot, obviously, and that's where the biohacker USA comes from. Well, I love that, and it's you explained it so well, and so uh, I'm really thoroughly impressed with with your your resume, and I got to review it, and uh, and I just I find it fascinating. I was in the Air Force for four years. I didn't, and uh, you you know I I respect anybody, and thank you for your service, and thank you out there for those who are listening who are in active military uh, or have been in the military because it takes a special person to do so. So we we had a little conversation in the pre show here, and I want to share a little bit because I think. What what you do, I, I love the uh, the courage and what you put yourself out there in, Neil. And I want two things. First of all, uh, you're Jewish, that and uh, but you're a Messianic Jew, and uh, you came to Jesus, love Jesus. I want to hear that story because I think it's fascinating. And you're Holy Spirit filled. I love that. Also, uh, I want to talk to you about what what are children because you're really. I, I see your practice is really concerned about children and adolescents. And, you know, uh, when I was in the insurance business years ago, we had this thing called the notch babies. And it was certain people born certain period of time that the United States government uh, adjusted or changed their social security benefits. And there was a big brouhaha about this. And it wasn't anything they did. It's just it was a Congress in time and it changed and it affected the money that they received. Well, as you and I were discussing earlier, I believe that this period during this pandemic period, there's going to be a notch here that these children, maybe between the ages of six and you know 17 or whatever the age is, school age, that's going to have a uh, a a, an effect on them for the rest of their life. And we're going to follow this through. And I wanted to ask you about that possibility too, and what we can do about that and what's going on with that. So uh, I'll shut up and let you speak, Neil. All right. Well, I guess the, the best thing is to talk about sort of my upbringing and my history. 
Um, I was raised in a traditional Jewish family. My mom and dad were Jewish, and uh, I attended uh, Hebrew school for about six years, learned to speak Hebrew, got went through all the usual uh, um, you know, sacraments associated with uh, Hebrew school and uh, the Jewish faith, um, and really enjoyed my Jewish faith, to be honest with you, and was bar mitzvahed. In fact, I even got to the point where the rabbi came up to me and asked me if I wanted to go to cantor school. Mm. And that would have been a big step for my family. I'm not sure I was ready for that. I mean, it was only 13, 14, 15 years old. Wow. That would have been a huge decision. I was already sort of committed to the idea that I was very interested in science. I was really sort of a science geeky kid. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I took apart things and I did experiments in the house. My mom probably was so freaked <laughs> out. <laughs> with the things that I was doing. And that sort of prepped me for high school. And I made a name for myself in high school and actually won the um, the international, you know you know how they had in high school and mid school uh, science fairs, mm -hmm. right? Well, okay, I was the king of science fairs. And in my area, I went to the international science and engineering fair and won uh, two years consecutively uh, research in biochemistry at age 15, 16, I was actually sent to Walter Reed Army Institute of Research to work on kidney disease as essentially a kid. And from that, I got a scholarship to go to medical school. And uh, that's what led me to go into medicine. Uh, the interesting story during this time is, is that um, I grew up, as I said, as a Jewish kid in my neighborhood. Um, but I really had, um, I had some Catholic kids that lived across the street um, and I was very interested every time I went over to the holidays because I really didn't understand the um, photographs that they had and the paintings of Christ and the Sacred Heart. And I just didn't understand the whole concept. And I would ask my mom about it. And she said, well, you know, Jesus is a prophet, honey, but, you know, we don't really believe in him. But I saw him. I saw his eyes. You know, this picture spoke to me. Wow. And I had this deep desire to get to know him even then. But I wasn't able to affect it at that point because I was just a kid. So time passes, of course, um, and I go off to Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, do my summer work there, uh, was paid, by the way, barely like nothing, like four dollars an hour. I was literally driving my car. Uh, I, I can't even tell you my my living situations. It was, it was horrible. Uh, living in Langley Park, Maryland, you know, in, wow. in, in, in the heat of Washington, D.C. during the summer as essentially a teenager, a minor. I mean, you can't imagine. My parents had Amazing. no idea what to do with me. They just <laughs> did not know what to do. With me. So anyways, well, it turns out that during this time, my dad uh, was very, very sick. Uh, between age 15 and 17, he came down with lung cancer. He was a mm. very heavy smoker, uh, smoked three and a half pack a day history, we tried to get him to stop smoking. He wouldn't. Uh, very stubborn that way. We saw very little of him. He worked very hard. My mom was um, an artist, basically this creative force in the family who, you know, just loved our family. We got a lot of nourishment, uh, emotional nourishment from her. But my dad was sort of, you know, absent a lot because mm -hmm. of the fact that he was sick and also the fact that he worked these horrible hours. Um, long story short, while I was at Walter Reed, I got a phone call from my mom. She said, you need to get back. And I came back and essentially, I mean, he was dying mm. and I took the responsibility to take him to his chemotherapy treatments at that point. Uh, and I had a car I could drive and so forth. My mom was trying to support the family on an artist's budget. And, um, and we had two other siblings who were younger than me. And uh, so uh, I took my dad to these chemotherapy treatments, and I was just really taken aback at that point by how uh, invisible I was to the medical system. Uh, here I was, I was really interested in science. I mm -hmm. thought I felt like I wanted to be a doctor, mm -hmm. but in my experiencing my dad's uh, uh, chemotherapy treatments and, and the way that I was treated as a family member, can you, if you can imagine a 16, 17 year old bringing your dad in for chemotherapy three times a week, watching him literally dying in front of my eyes mm -hmm. while my mom is working and they treated me like crap. It's crazy. And I was, I, I vowed at that point that, you know what? Where's the humanity in this? These people are doctors. You've got dying people here. I vowed at that point that I was going to be a doctor. 
Wow. And I was going to prove the system wrong. I was wow. going to take care of people, not like I was taking care of, but to do it differently with humanity, with care, uh, because I don't think they had any concept at all that I was even important in that relationship. So this was that still really, being, really. So yeah. uh, Neil, I'm sorry. This was still before you knew Jesus. Yes, that is true. And yes. so, okay, all right, all right. Yeah, Continue. I was still, I was still a minor. I was still living in my household. I was still Jewish, right. completely Jewish at that point. Yeah. Um, and so, um, but long story short, is that solidified me being a doctor, and I decided to go into pediatrics ultimately. I went forward with my scholarship, went to Ohio State University, where I majored in microbiology and immunology, I got my scholarship, which was a health profession scholarship, had a long commitment in my, in my uh, education, and that's where I met my wife. And my wife is a Catholic. So here I was coming back to a <laughs> Catholic girl, right? Oh, wow. Um, How'd your mother take that? How'd your mother deal with that? Uh, yeah, well, not not well at first, because <laughs> now, now she, was, she was a widow, right? She was yeah. a widow. And her son is moved on to a Catholic girl who he met. And I studied with um, Peggy. That's her name, Peggy, mm -hmm. uh, short for Margaret. And uh, we studied uh, in medical school and I brought her home and so forth. And really, well, I think my mom grew to love her, uh, although wasn't quite certain about the whole thing. But I should tell you, my mom remarried at that point, married a Methodist man. So with the 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 uh, the uh, the uh, the fixture of having a, a Jewish man in the household sort of setting the stage for, you know, only being Jewish, that that was broken. And right. OK, so, there, so were that would... there were some liberties taking place, although my mom yeah. always remained Jewish. Yeah. And so, so she was a practicing Jew. I wouldn't say so. No, okay. I think she I think she was very lax in her. Okay. Um, she followed the guidance of the family, which the that that whole uh, dogma, if you will, was sort yeah. of set by, I think, the male of the family. Gotcha. And so did, was Peggy instrumental in bringing you to Jesus? So, um, no, I wouldn't say so. But what I noticed is that as her parents adopted me as their newfound son, because they loved me, um, they were devout Catholics, devout Catholics. Sure. And I would attend Catholic services with them when I would go up to Connecticut to see them. Uh, and we'd go into the Catholic Church, and that really was my first exposure in the Catholic Church. Now, I should tell you that uh, when I graduated medical school, we, Peg and I decided that uh, uh, we were go we were going to be married at the end of medical school, and uh, we tried to find a Jewish rabbi to marry us, and all of them refused. Ah. So we we found a Jesuit priest who actually a Catholic priest who was willing to marry us in a Hebrew service in a Catholic church. Wow. He was radical. No, he was radical. And you know, the Jesuits <laughs> are known for that. Apparently they're known for that. Wow. That's and, pretty cool. Uh, that's I, pretty I think cool. there's some history there with the Jesuits. You can look at, look into yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. On the fringe and he saw it as a challenge. So he was willing to marry us. So in the church, now, it's the Catholic side of the family and the Jewish side of the family brought together. Most of the Jews would never step into a Catholic church. Right. But they were brought together in this beautiful ceremony. The whole, entire ceremony was in Hebrew under the chuppah. And I mean, the breaking of the glass and all the prayers oh, were in Hebrew, including Peggy's prayers were in Hebrew. Wow. So I think they, they, you know, they felt belonged at that point. Right. Yeah. But I was still not a Catholic. OK, now we had agreed to the priest that we would raise our children Catholic. That's sort of like the deal. You know? Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to yeah. marry you and you're going to yeah. have kids. By gosh, yeah. they're going to be Catholic. Yeah, okay. that's the agreement uh, that you have to go. Yeah, OK, in. if you yeah. marry us, that's fine. We'll agree to anything at this point. Right. <laughs> right. So, I mean, it was sort of funny. But anyways, uh, my family ultimately did uh, love Peggy and continue. That's awesome. All right. So, all right. So you, guys, so you guys get married and you're married in the Catholic church and what, and cause you're Holy spirit filled, you, you love Jesus and you know, you accepted Jesus as your Lord and savior, Neil. At what point was there, was there a, a lightning bolt? Was there a Harry Potter moment? Was there, or just, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, no, there was a, there was a definitely a lightning bolt. So we, uh, so Peg and I, uh, we, we had our, we got married, as I told you, I wanted to accept the, the sacraments of the Catholic Church because mm -hmm. I felt like if I'm going to raise my child Catholic, I better know something about it, right? Sure. And here I was, it's interesting that I came back to, you know, Catholicism because I had 
already been had some exposure as a child. I had a little understanding. So my wife's like, well, no, you can't take the Holy Sacraments unless you go through RCIA, uh, Rights of Christian. So I wanted to do that. But in order to do that, um, I really had a lot of guilt about it uh, because, you know, I mean, I would be like giving up all of my Jewishness. And so so mm -hmm. at that time, we had already uh, I had finished my um, army career. We had moved back to the deep south here in Georgia. And lo and behold, in the community that I was living is this preacher named Sid Roth. <laughs> now, I didn't know he lived in my town. I love and I would it. see him. I mean, and if you've met Sid it. Roth and talked to Sid Roth, I mean, he's an imposing figure. Yeah. Well, totally. I was participating in a Seder with my Gentile friends, and uh, they invited me because I knew the brachos and I could sing them in Hebrew. So I was doing that as a joint thing, and Sid Roth was officiating, and he said, hey, you know, uh, Neil, would you like to come to a revival that I'm having at the Christian Renewal Church in Brunswick? Uh, and I said, uh, sure. I had no idea what I was getting into, didn't know, right? So I, I went, um, and I, 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 I mean, I went with some moral support people with me. I had no idea what a revival was, uh, had no concept whatsoever. Sid is officiating over it. They were calling Yeshua from the rafters. Uh, there were, this is a Pentecostal uh, church. So there were lots of things that I felt really uncomfortable with. Uh, people speaking in tongues, people falling down. I mean, just really awkward. And I'm thinking, what am I doing here, right? <laughs> I mean, like, what did I step into? What did I say yes to, right? But the, there was no doubt that the Holy Spirit was present there. Wow. Uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit was present in the room that Come day. On. And he had an altar call. Now, I know it's an altar call now, but I didn't know what it was. Sure. He just called for people to come down to the fort. And if they were willing to accept Christ in their life at that moment, please come down. And I did amongst many, many other people. And it was at that moment that I accepted Christ in my life, truly in my heart. Where that did Love not, it. I mean, I was always curious, but never made it to the point of that. So these these incredible opportunities were presenting. So I was, you know, sweating and nervous and tearful and crying. I was just elated by the whole experience. And, I, and my wife is not present, mind you now. Okay, she's not there. These are a few friends of my workmates who were with me. And I go back to my seat. And Michael, I... Something happened to me. Mm. I I looked at my, I was looking, I was sweating so profusely. I was looking at my hands and in the palms of my hands was not sweat, but was liquid gold. Come on. Liquid geez. gold running from my lifelines. I kept wiping it away. I kept wiping it off of my hands and it would bead back up. And I'm like, You've got to be kidding me. What is going on? I mean, I was really shook up. And I, I mean, I was, I was literally crying. And I'm showing my the people that are I'm there with. I said, what is this? What happened? You know, I'm crying. I'm bawling. I don't right. fall. I'm a, I'm a doctor, a skeptic, a man of science. I have no explanation for this. Okay. Um, and, wow. and, I, and I still didn't know about what it, this was. And I, I thought, okay, there's got to be an explanation. I touched a book. I touched a binding of something that had some guilt on it or something, and it got on my hands. No, none of the books had any silver, gold, or anything. And again, this would bead right back up in my hands. And I'm pulling it. I'm wow. literally spinning it around in my hand. As th it was as though a thermometer broke open in my hand, like the mercury was wow. out there, but it was gold. That's humongous. So That's people huge. People were freaked out. I was freaked out, right? <laughs> I so you were. I go back home. I'm really, I tell my wife about it and she's like, you know, she saw, she saw the remnants of it. But then what happened over the next two days is where that gold had pooled in the palms of my hands, I now had burns and the skin had lifted off. And I had about a quarter size blister on both of my palms where the skin was sensitive. It was red. It hurt. And I didn't have it anywhere else. And I, I, I was like, oh, my God, what has happened to me? Wow. And I just wanted to deny it at that point because I just really, I needed an explanation. So I called Sid Roth. 
I was on a first name basis at that time. Sure, we went sure. to a Chinese restaurant and then just a quick side note, Jews love Chinese food, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and we have one Chinese restaurant in Brunswick, Georgia, in the middle of the deep south. And he meets me in a Chinese restaurant. You know, he's from New York. Yes. So oh. so he meets me and I tell him about, I got to talk to him about something, please. And you've got to explain something. And I sit across the table and he takes my hand from me and he sees, he sees my hand. He sees the blister and he says, I said, I said, what is this? What, what has happened? And he says, Neil. You have been anointed by the Holy Spirit, and you have been given a power that you need to use in your healing and your dealing with children Come on. To, to heal them and bless them. And I said, anointing? What is that? I just didn't understand. And I was still, I mean, I was just so emotional from the whole thing. And every time I tell this story, I have the same yeah. flushing that I had yeah. then. I mean, it's just as live to me now. Yeah, as it was, and this is twenty five years ago. Come on, twenty five years ago. All okay? right, so so this was a, this was a life changing event, obviously. And, oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I, lo I love I love it. I, it's good, and and I want to ask you because this is where you know one of the things that I was really looking forward to this interview with you is because uh, I kind of watch. I'm an observer, you know. I kind of see what's going on out there and how things are affected. And we talked about. You know, when 9-11 occurred, how that affected our children. I think our kids are on the same age and they were very young at that moment. And, you know, at that time, you know, I remember I, I didn't realize how the effect would be upon them. And and then 2008 happened with the big crash, you know, right. and how that affected the millennials and how they view money and how all that situation, you know, because I remember after 9-11, there was a lot of people that, that quit their jobs and moved out, you know, to the, you know, to the farm and said, I'm done with this. I'm not going to be anywhere near a city where a plane can come in. And so it, it had a huge effect. And, and today, you know, we've had this pandemic, right? So, you know, 2020, I remember seeing, you know, uh, the president and the whole uh, barrage of experts coming on t national television, you know, during the middle of the uh, afternoon and start talking about, um, you know, flattening the curve. Remember the two week flattening the curve. It's like, what the hell is that? You know, and it's like, this is crazy. And so, but it was real. And I remember going to the, the grocery store, uh, you know, I wore gloves. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's the middle of the, you know, it's crazy, you know, and cause I didn't know, you know, I'm just, you know, uh, and so, with all this and then of course it was it was a domino effect obviously we all know uh and it went through there and, and i think one of the biggest things that i want to hear from you is how is this going to affect those children at maybe you know from age four from age five i don't know six you know they had to wear a mask they didn't get to go to school they got had to had to go you know they didn't get that social interaction yeah. just not wearing just wearing mask at school itself you know and, and not truly, you know, that, the, you know, being able to see facial recognition and, you know, these are mental things that we need to You're do right need, on the money. We need to pick this up. So, Neil, how is this going to affect these children five years from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now? Yeah, right now, horribly. What I've witnessed is, is horrible. You know, I'm in the practice of pediatric and adolescent medicine. I do counseling now. I'm in a holistic Christian counseling center after getting canceled from my hospital because I spoke out about the, uh, the, the lack of wisdom concerning uh, vaccinating children for which we don't know what the repercussions are of the vaccine. So that's one aspect of the pandemic. What is the effect of that on our children's legacy? Uh, and, and so my, my role was to try to give discernment to parents so they would make wise and informed decisions. But for that reason, I was essentially let go from my regular job in the mm -hmm. hospital of 37 years. to, to and, and so I was seeing clients, patients in the office while I was still at the hospital. And of course, they're all wearing masks. Uh, you only see their eyes. They're, they're, they've missed all, essentially two years of education a horrible education, doing right. online things, lots of deep depression, lots of unsuredness, lots and lots of anxiety in their lives, yeah. and nothing reassuring coming back from the parents because they're just as badly affected. Sure. And then you have parents who either lost their lives as a result of getting COVID or as a result of the consequence of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And these kids now are left with the legacy of a missing parent 
or being in the care of grandparents, yeah. not sure what the future holds for them, right? And they're looking for someone to give them some hope. So these kids primarily, if I could put it into one word, it's yeah. lack of hope. They have wow. experienced a lack of hope, wow. a lack of purpose, and, and, and essentially gave up on their school careers. You know, no and, motivation to do anything. And no so, motivation to return to school. And with that, and with that, I mean, you know, we've had, you know, also, you know, we we've seen the great resignation as well, right? In the in in our adulthood, right? In our, you know, but in that, what what do you see? What what can we do? And you know, we don't know what the effects going to be ten years from now. We can only you know hypo hypothesize what it's going to be based on our previous knowledge. But I know it's good. there. There's got to be an effect. Yes, I mean, it's, there's going to be something on this. Right. What what can we do? And what are you doing to help these children out? Okay, so first of all, is uh, on first of all, we need to understand that different ages respond differently, right? Yes. yes. Younger children who have no cognition of what the of the world is right now, they don't understand future looking. They just know in the moment. They're watching their parents. Yes. The parents need to be the role models. The parents and the grandparents need to be role models for their younger children. Mm. The children who are in precognition. Uh, those that they need to see a presence of a parent, uh, uh, unquestionable un, un, uh, love and support. Uh, kids need that. Yes. They, need to be, they need to see family. They need to be supporting family. They need a understanding within their knowledge, um, ability to process, right? Nothing fearful uh, that uh, their parents or grandparents are going to be there for them because they're very worried. Yes. They're very worried. Will, will my grandparents survive? It can, am I responsible as a five-year-old for my grandpa's death mm. because I didn't wear my mask mm. and I killed him? Mm. See the guilt that mm. this society has put upon the children. We need to remove them from that entirely. Yes. We need to get, remove all media exposure from them, whether it be in television, cartoons, or media, good. and we need to give them one-to-one -one parental support it's and good. any other emotional support and reunite the families and try to get rid of all this discord with, and that splits families. It's we good. cannot have that for children. They cannot tolerate it. They don't understand it, and they can't process it. That's good. Now, for the, yeah, Go ahead. For the yeah. older kids, that's a different group. Yeah. That's a different group. Those kids also need to be devoid of media because as you know mm. the mainstream media is nothing but bad news right totally and what nothing what age, when you say older children neil what what age what age bracket i would say okay. 10 and above okay all right good 10 and above those are kids that are beginning to process more abstractly they have mm. a mind for uh essentially wh what is what is the future what happens if i do this and then something else happens so they're uh, they're developing their conduct uh, their deductive reasoning skills. Yeah, yeah, less concrete, uh, less concrete thinking and more abstract thinking. That's gotcha. the developmental stage. I say occurs at around age ten. Okay, and then what about uh, the uh, <laughs> pardon me, the children that were you know sixteen maybe to nineteen when all this was going yeah. down? So so those kids are the ones who probably are the most severely affected. Because they are the ones who are have lost hope for what they could be as an adult. Mm. They're missing two years of school. So yeah. if they're if they're uh, tenth graders, they really have an eighth grade education. Wow. Uh, they're dumbing down the curriculum. The kids that are coming out of high school now, and I've seen this time and time again in the last few years, they come out of high school. They're quote unquote prepared for college, mm. but they're not prepared. Right. They still can't read. They still can't process. They're missing basic concepts in in math, and the teachers have done nothing to re uh, to support that or to return what was stolen to them for two years. Mm. And then all of a sudden they're out there in college and trying to you know they're paying the bill now for the college yeah. education, right? And they're right. not cutting the grade, and they realize that they can't make it. Yeah, and uh, that's such a, a it's such a horrible situation with them and my heart goes out to them and the parents, you know, we were Stacy and I were blessed that our kids were already through college, all already through everything and didn't have to deal with this. And my heart goes out to these parents 
uh, that had to deal with that were right in that sweet spot or that bad spot, you know, at, you know, second grade on up to, you know, high school to deal but, with this. Uh, but Michael, I want to make a comment if I yeah. can. There's a second threat yeah. that happened to those teenagers. And the second threat, and I'm going to go there now, that is, is that in order to go to college, they required them to get vaccinated. vaccinated. That's right. Okay. That's the right. problem with that is, is that that mandate was very, very ill-advised because they did not know what the repercussions were for those people. Right. And I had lots and lots of teens that were vaccinated, and some of those kids suffered immeasurable consequences to their health as a result of, of side effects that were not predictable or did not know right. what was going to happen until, as we see this great experiment being played out, kids dropping dead with myocarditis, kids dropping dead with heart attacks, Yes. kids never able to get back to their full um, health, okay? And then the mental anguish that occurred as a result mm -hmm. of that, knowing that they had a ticking time bomb in them that hasn't yet revealed what was going to happen down the line, potentially affecting their future fertility, their ability to have children when they wanted to, mm -hmm. uh, lots and lots of those threats. And that underlying anxiety that they help hold is literally like okay what's the point right the yeah point? so you so they develop it basically a defeatist attitude and or depression absolutely so absolutely. okay um so what happens to the kids that were just in the college here they get maybe they're starting their sophomore year 2020 and everything shuts down and you know not only financially you know because i know that you know, I heard that they had still had, if you're at Harvard or Yale or Princeton or probably Ohio State University or University of Michigan or wherever, ASU, you still had to pay the tuition. Even if you're working uh, on a computer at home, you still had to pay that $30,000 right. semester commission, uh, yeah. you know, uh, uh, tuition. So what happened to them to lose that period of time? Well, some of them, some of them didn't complete. Some of yeah. them dropped out and uh, failed at that and did not have any desire to go back. Uh, some had a hard time getting the, enough energy to do an online course. There was no feedback, no to and fro with the teachers. And again, you have this whole humbling experience with the mask over the face, mm -hmm. which is essentially a mechanism of dehumanizing, uh, de yeah. de humanification. You know, uh, we, we are... We are God's creatures, right? Uh, we speak right. to each other through our eyes. In fact, my right. camera right now is is literally right over your face That's because right. I want to see your face, right? That's mm -hmm. how human beings act. We have kids now that come in, they're wearing the mask. You don't see their facial expressions. You have mm -hmm. no idea where to read their emotional state. They right. won't look at you. They look down, right? downtrodden, right? This is not the spirit of God. The right. spirit of God has essentially. This has been an attempt, and this is my this is my my uh, you know it's my opinion I suppose, but probably one of many others. But looking at it from a holistic standpoint now that I have a perspective of discernment, part of my anointing, if you will, is I recognize that the environment and the um, the matters of the world have attempted to take the joy and the love out of our children and it's an existential threat to them Amen. because you are talking about crushing the holy spirit that remains within them and on top of it modifying their genetics so that they don't even represent the god that created them you know we are built in the temple in the image of god the right. temple of god That's we right. have the genetic signature god's fingerprints are all over us right so and now good. we've had this attempt by man to subvert that right to mm -hmm. compromise that code compromise that that genetic signature to make us something less human than what we were supposed to be and that's so, really worrisome it is it, it truly is and so uh neil let me ask you this and so if it, uh because what you're saying is is really it's truth is disturbing it's all of the above and yeah and you know <clears throat> i one of the things that I have to refer back to in in, in the Bible, in the text, right? Is that, you know, 
uh, Romans 8, 28, I get protected in all things as I obey Jesus, right? And obedient to him, which I, which, you know, and I, and listen, I've got some good, really good brothers and sisters in Christ who got, you know, who taken the jab and done this and I pray for them. And, you know, and it, you know, it could have been, you know, in the military that could have had, it was a special deal or whatever. And I, I can't judge them. I just pray for them. And so with that, uh, I want to ask you how, what what in your practice today? What is it that you're doing to help people deal with this situation uh, physically and and a whole, I know you take a holistic approach. So what's the step and how do they get a hold of you in this process too? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's so coming. I have a website, of course. Yeah, I'll, I'll put that out there. It's www.biohackerusa.com. Cool it's website, www. bro. www.biohackerusa.com and the place that I work at is called Centered for Life meaning Centered for Christ, uh, centeredforlife.com. That's the agency that I work for. Uh, so if, if, that's uh, Thanks, Neil. And I'll make sure that's in the show notes too. Uh, our producers will put that in. So if if somebody says, man, I want to get a hold of you, what do you what, what's the process for them to come yeah. through? So and, all, I, have a, I have, a, I have a, a button on my website that says schedule your appointment, schedule okay. your consultation. Okay. And then from there, we'll take them to a page and they can register and then we'll arrange for either a telehealth visit okay. or an actual okay. in-person visit. And also, uh, Michael, I am willing to go out to churches and small community groups and give lectures and talks about biohacking and what you can do to fortify yourself, not just mentally, spiritually, but physically. Right. Awesome. There are avenues of approach where we have a defense system, okay? Yes. God put that defense system in us. We need to know how to turn it on and know how to use it. And it isn't always using pharmaceuticals. The pharmaceuticals were created by the pharmaceutical company, which mm -hmm. is just another extension of all the other stuff that's out there. You know, the experimental jab is a pharmaceutical. Sure. There's a lot of money in that. Right. Get away from some of that stuff, okay? Yep. Um, so that's what biohacking is about. Biohacking is about reverting your genetics back to their original state so that you have the integrity of the, 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 the system that God put in you. You've restored it back to its what it was meant to do. And, and I can't quote the scripture by Mark, but Mark says, I believe it's Mark 4, says that even though I drink the poison and I walk on serpents and scorpions, that if I believe in Christ, that I will be protected and no harm will come of me. It's good. That's not, that's a paraphrase. Yes. No, I, I understand you. Hey, Hey, let me ask you this too, because uh, I know, you know, I've got some other doctor friends too, or believers, which I love hanging out with them, but there's this thing called T cell memory. Yeah. Yes. And what, tell our audience what T cell memory does. Okay. So T cell is part of your, uh, both adaptive and your innate immune system. Mm. And I'm going to just give a brief, I'm going to give a brief science talk right now. So yes. you ask a technical question. You have three types of immunity. You have a barrier immunity. That's a physical barrier. That's what they try to do with the mass. Doesn't work. The innate immunity is that God given immunity that is broad spectrum and extremely robust. It includes your T cells. And your T cells process everything that runs through you, everything you eat, everything you breathe. And in that, it screens and scans for uh, threats. And in response to that, you develop this broad, very, very uh, powerful ability to fight off almost anything. That's your innate immune system. Then you have a specific immunity. That is what they're attempting to do with the jab. OK, I won't use the V word on it because it doesn't deserve the V word. OK, the problem with the jab is the jab is being specifically directed to the spike protein. The problem is the spike protein is the disease. But this jab was not ever meant to eradicate the spike protein. It was only meant to reduce symptoms and reduce the risk of hospitalization. Mm. It was never meant to try to eradicate and destroy the virus. That's the job of the innate immune system, which is where that broad spectrum T cell function is. So the fact that you have T cell memory, that is a little, um, it's a little confusing for people because all the jab is working on is B cell memory. Mm. B cell is for you to make antibodies against the virus, but it does not eradicate. And in fact, you know, because you're only 
uh, addressing the spike protein, most people will escape. In other words, the virus mm -hmm. will escape. You feel better. You got over it for that episode, but the virus went on and jumped off of you to somebody else and now is mutated to the next variant, which is why we're seeing endless variants. And we will right. continue to see those because the, that, the, the uh, jab was never designed to completely eradicate. And so, yes. And so, so we want to we want to work on your innate immune system. Yes. We want to so, work on that God given power right. that is in all of us to fight at the broad level. That is where the secret to defeating this virus is. Amen. And so, one of the things you know, I had uh, I had uh, uh, COVID, uh, and I had I think I got the Om Omicron variant. Uh, I was sick for a few days, but nothing bad. It was like a, a light case of the flu. So now I have an immune system to that since my T cell memory is in there. Yes. Yes, that's correct. That's right. And so and you are better off actually with that immunity had than had you taken the, the jab, jab yeah. which actually suppressed your innate immunity in, in order to have an, a, a, with this, this specific immunity, which is far inferior that specific immunity to the individual variant is yeah. far yeah. less helpful to you than the broad approach that your body took when you were naturally exposed and got over it. It's good. All right. And so uh, one of the things that I've also heard and learned, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, vitamin D is a big, is a big thing. Is yeah. it not? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. It's a big thing. I can tell, I can tell your audience for those that just want to, you know, some simple things to do. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, vitamin D, absolutely. Almost everyone who ever got COVID had a low vitamin D level or suboptimal. So, and, that, and that's just by the nature. We don't drink milk or whatever, but a lot of people are vitamin D deficient. And it does not matter about sunshine. You can't get enough sunshine to raise your vitamin D to an adequate level. I'm just going to say that. Good to know. So you need a supplement. You need, it needs to be in your diet every day. And Number can, two. Yes. Number two, you need zinc. Zinc is an innate part of your immune system. Your immune cells and T cells and cells that fight your battles for you cannot do their work if you do not have zinc in your system. And almost all those medicines that you heard about, you've heard about ivermectin, you've heard about mm -hmm. HCQ and Zithromax, for example. The reason that they function is, is because they allow zinc to pour into the cell so that your immune system can fight off the virus. Good. They act as ionospheres, so the ionophores, and they allow you to direct zinc to do your battles. So those medicines are there to aid that process. Awesome. Vitamin C, which is part of your barrier and your innate immune system. Key, use of other um, stimulated, uh, stimulative uh, immune products like probiotics and elderberry, extremely effective. Elderberry has been used for years and centuries for people to aid them in um, uh, healing them from the flu. It's because it has lots and lots of quercetin in it, which is essentially antiviral. So these are incredible compounds, all of them given by God, all of them can be found in nature. And if people will just do these basic things that will help, but I wanna look, I, I don't know how much time we have, but there's one more. Go ahead, please. And the last one is something called activation of the genetic NRF2 pathway which is a immune regulatory pathway that's responsible for healing and detoxification. And we can all turn this on by certain foods and certain food groups, which speak to that gene specifically and allow it to mount an incredible antioxidant response, which is the primary way that the uh, virus, the bad virus um, damages people. It creates a huge oxidative stress. And if we can reduce oxidative stress by turning on the NRF2 pathway, and if people come to my site, they can watch my videos about activation of NRF2, and they can ask me specifically, and I will help them. Come on. I love that. I love that. All right. My last question and uh, is, if you have a severe morbid morbidity, right? If you have a, uh, maybe you have a heart disease, maybe you've had uh, diabetes and you're overweight, whatever the situation is, and you're over 65, 75 years old, what do you suggest they do? The same things. Same I, thing. I, I, I'm going to say that I, I, I want to say something about the jab real quick. Okay. Yes. And something that people don't know. And I know people don't, and I'm trying to be very careful about how I choose my words here. Um, the, the natural virus 
is uh, it, it contains a virus and it has spike protein, and it also has an outer coat, which is called the nucleocapsid, okay? When your immune system sees that, it sees the entire virus. But the thing that causes the illness is spike protein. Now, if you think about it, the jab is nothing more than a concentrated dose of spike protein put into an artificial viral package, but no nuclear capsid is in it. But yet it has all of the genetic instruction set. In mm -hmm. fact, getting the jab will give you trillions and trillions of copies of the spike protein, whereas the natural infection may only give you a couple hundred thousand. Gotcha. So you are actually making yourself worse, in my mind, by taking a jab that has very little chance of helping you and all the possibility of harming you. Wow. And they did not understand this. And now as it plays out, people will discover that. So first avoid that, if at all possible. Sure. I do not sure. recommend it. And then try to restore these levels that we talked about, vitamin D, vitamin C, uh, quercetin, all these other ingredients we talked about. There are some drugs that are helpful. They've been talked about. Of course, they've been dissed. Um, they, they do work because they are antiviral. They stop the replication of the virus. They, that, is the, that is the function of those antibiotics. I'm not going to name them on, on the air. Sure. The, the ones that have been very controversial that people have dissed actually function not only by bringing zinc into the cell and helping you fight, but they also turn off the replication process if you get into them early enough and not wait for the disease to finish its replication, overwhelm the system, and then get into the cytokine storm, which is what kills people. Okay, do not, so- Do not sit on it, do right. not wait, act quickly within the first five days and treat yourself, get yourself Amen. treated. All right, and so if uh, if somebody out here is listening and they have some questions, I'll go to your website. Can you also help if their children are suffering from uh, some of these psychological issues that uh, happened during this pandemic? Can you either steer them in the right direction or offer counseling to them? Yes, absolutely. I'm happy to talk to anybody about okay. anything. It's possible, though, that, again, because we are social animals, that kids especially need to have a little more close contact with somebody sure. that they trust. But if I'm that first cog to get them help in that regard, you know, to so even though I'm a long distance away, I'm sure. happy to, to, to steer them and give them a game plan, or at least okay. give the parents a game plan. Absolutely. That's awesome. All right. So, uh, all right. So you've been such a tremendous guest, Neil. I really appreciate you being on next level. You're totally next level. Let me ask you that. I always ask my uh, guest, uh, what scripture are you sitting on right now? And uh, what interesting books are you reading currently? Okay. Um, so <laughs> yeah, that, that really is putting me on the spot. I read <laughs> lots and lots of books. I got to tell you, you that I am reading um, The Circle Maker by... Yes. Uh, yes. Batman. Yes. Uh, and I, I read that. I have both issues. And I'm also reading um, uh, Jesus Calling, which I read scripture in that every day. Um, I also am really, I want to tell you, um, there's a, there's a TV show called the chosen, which I think you know yes, about. And that, that, that show spoke to me because it was part of my rekindling of my re-anointing in most recent months. Uh, as I left my, uh, my uh, recent practice, it was very instrumental for me. So, um, I'm not going to discount the importance of media, um, <laughs> as far as specific scripture, mm -hmm. I'm going to just say Isaiah. Uh, 54, uh, Isaiah 57, uh, I, I, I feel as though the, um, the powers and the negative forces of Satan that are out there cannot touch me because I'm a righteous man and because I'm uh, trying to do the will and glory of God every day in my work. Awesome. And that's what that's what I strive for. Come on, brother. I love it. I love it. Well, Neil, you've been amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Neil Go Goodman. And uh, and check him out. Go listen, go go to his website at at uh, biohackerusa.com and uh, see what's going on over there with uh, Dr. Neil Goodman, because he is next level all the way. So thank you, hey, my brother. Hey, Mike, I have yeah. a book. I have a book, too. Uh, that's on that website, but it's also on Amazon.com, and it's called The Biohacker's Guide to the Galaxy. Okay. So I oh, encourage I my guests to try to get that because it talks all about that NRF2. 
It's I love there. that. I was going to ask you. I figured you had you probably had several books out there. So that's awesome. All right. Go check out his book. Check He's on Amazon and check his website out. And uh, yeah, Neil, you're amazing. And thank you, Sandy, for recommending my man here. Hey, listen, we're going to have to you guys got to it, it, it seems like a really interesting corner of Earth there where you guys are at there in Georgia in the deep south. You guys got kind of a there's like a triangle of amazing people down there so uh i'm gonna have to come down there and pay a visit Oh, absolutely you need to come down and experience it for yourself. yeah yeah well thank you brother it was great to have you on here i appreciate your insight appreciate your wisdom and uh listen listeners go check him out go to his website give him a call thank you neil thank you so much michael